Father in heaven, Lord God of the universe, I'm so thankful that we have hope in Jesus Christ. I'm thankful that one day soon, all that we see in this world shall be no more, and you will usher in eternal righteousness. Will there be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more parting? We look forward to that day. And Father, you clearly outline in your word that we are rapidly approaching the hour in which we will see Jesus. And so I pray that as we open your word, that you would open our eyes, that we might behold wondrous things out of thy law. And as I love to claim your promise in Jeremiah 33 and verse 3, you said, call upon me and I will answer thee, and I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Father in heaven, please take hold of this feeble mind, this feeble man, and use me for your honor and your praise, that Christ might be lifted up. For he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. Bless your people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amazing times we're living in, wouldn't you say? You know, just the other day I had the opportunity to share with some college students in Virginia, and I saw something on the news that really impressed me. It was a story that came out in the news how China had entered into some new type of security pact with the Solomon Islands. And this greatly disturbed the nation of Australia because of Solomon Islands' close proximity to themselves. And Australia warned that if China was to set up some type of military base, some type of military installment on the Solomon Islands, that they would take this as a direct threat to their sovereignty as a nation. And so Australia has begun to tell their people that we should prepare for war. We're living in turbulent times, aren't we? As I heard that story, it reminded me of something that just happened a few years ago. I was out in the Solomon Islands with my family, my wife, Denise, my daughter, Heaven, and as I was doing some evangelistic meetings there in a very rural era, you would define it as the jungle, most certainly. Just to tell you how rural it was, there was a massive tree located by where I was doing the meetings, and it was so large that there were families that built some small structures connected to the tree, and they made that tree their home. As I came to the end of the evangelistic series that I was doing in the Solomon Islands, we had a little Sabbath luncheon as a send away. And there was a gentleman that came in to the meeting hall. I don't remember seeing him throughout the meetings, but he approached me and he asked me if I would be willing to go with him to meet a friend of himself, a friend of his. And I said, I'd be willing to do so. Let me inform my wife that I'd be going and we could be going on our way. And so I did just that, and we, jumped, we jumped into his Jeep, and we headed down the dirt road. In the darkness, over the roaring of the engine of his Jeep, I began to inquire, who are we going to see? But I received no response from this gentleman. And I thought to myself, well, perhaps he could not hear when I asked him, who are we going to see? So I thought, let me ask him again, who are we going to see? Once again, I received no response. So now I'm getting a little bit anxious. And so I thought, I need to raise up my voice a little bit louder. Who are we going to see? And the third time, the gentleman still did not answer my inquiry. Now at this time, I'm beginning to assess my surroundings. I'm in the Solomon Islands, in the jungle. It's dark. I'm driving in a vehicle with a man that I've never met before. So at this point in time, I begin to pray in my heart. And I say, Lord, if my time has come, be with me. A few minutes more down the road, now he, does, he makes the decision that he's going to surrender the information to me. And he tells me that we're going to see the prime minister of the Solomon Islands. Apparently, he and the prime minister were boyhood friends. And there was some issue going on in the government, and he wanted me to sit down with the prime minister to pray with him and to talk with him. And sure enough, as we got to the facility where the prime minister was located... It was very clear that the soldiers were very familiar with him because as soon as they looked in the window of the Jeep and they saw his face, they immediately opened up the gate and in we were. And he parked his car in the lot and he said, okay, I'm going inside, I'll come back to get you. It was around 9.30 at this time and so I was sitting in the car, 9.30, 10.30, 11.30, 11.30. As 11.30 rolls around, I'm wondering, what is going on? 
and I began to pray, as I think many of you would do as well. But my prayer went like this. I said, Lord, if you're not going to use me, because I wasn't planning on being here, if you're not going to put your words in my mouth, if I have no purpose for being here, then please don't let me go into this place. I don't want to fail you. I don't want to make your name a disgrace. But God, if you will be with me, if you'll put your words in my mouth, if you give me the words that you desire for me to speak, then open the doors for me to go in. 12.30 rolled around, and the gentleman emerged from the building, came to the vehicle, and he said, okay, it's time to go in now. Apparently, as I stated earlier, there was some type of issue, some type of crisis that had broken out in the government, and there was feuding that was going on in the room. And it was very apparent as I came into the quarters and I passed by the picture of the prime minister with the president of the United States of America and the head of the United Nations. And then I came into the room and I saw all the individuals situated around the room. I could clearly see that they were not happy with one another. Matter of fact, they put their faces to the wall when they saw me walk in. And the gentleman introduced me and he said, this is an evangelist from the United States of America. I've brought him here to pray with you and to talk with you. And before I opened my mouth, I prayed and I said, Lord, put your words in my mouth. And as I began to speak, as I began to speak, I shared with him from the book of Revelation chapter 7, beginning at verse 1, where the Bible tells us, and after these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth holding the four winds of the earth so that the winds would not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice unto the four angels, unto whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I began to explain to the prime minister that right now God in his love and in his mercy has set his angels as sentinels around our world to hold back the winds of strife, the winds of commotion, to hold back bloodshed, the devil and his angels even, from wreaking havoc on the face of planet Earth as no human pen has the ability to depict. But I said that this will only transpire for a probationary period of time. Great changes are getting ready to take place on the face of planet Earth. Great changes that are going to demand you in the position that you're in, that God has set you up in for such a time as this. Because God is the one that sets up kings and takes them down. Decisions are going to come to you that you're going to have to make for your constituents, for your people, and God is going to call you into account as to how you lead your people. And as I was sharing these things, you could tell that the atmosphere in the room begun to change. The Spirit of God was working. And the men that previously had their faces fixated on the wall, they began to turn their faces from the wall and fixated their eyes on myself as God was speaking to warn them and to alert them to the reality of the nearness of a change of all things as we presently know it. And friends, I thank God that I was able to share with them the things that I shared with them that day and share it with them with boldness because God's word is certain. God's word is sure. Our lives, our lives can be anchored in the word because we know that God will never fail us. The Bible tells us this with great clarity in the book of 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. It, said, it tells us there with great clarity we have also a more sure word of prophecy. We're unto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawns and the day star arises in our hearts. God has given us a certain word, a word that we can take to the bank, as they like to say. One that we can invest the fullness of our trust in. The more sure word of prophecy that the Lord has given us, it has a very special function. We're told that it will guide us like a burning torch in this hour of gross darkness that is enveloping planet Earth. Can't you see it? The more sure word of prophecy is to guide us until the day dawns and the day star arises in our hearts. Now, friends, you know the day star. Oh, the day star is none other than Jesus Christ. Because the word of God tells us in the book of Revelation, chapter 1 and verse 16, as John was on the Isle of Patmos 
and he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Jesus met with him and he gives us a description there as to what Jesus looked at and looked like in Revelation 1 and verse 16. The Bible tells us that in his right hand were seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance, meaning his visage, his face, shined like the sun in its strength. Then in the book of Revelation, chapter 22 and verse 16, Jesus himself said, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. I am the bright and morning star. Jesus, my friends, is that spiritual son of righteousness. He is the bright and morning star. The word of God in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19 tells us that the more sure word of prophecy is that agency that God is using to turn our focus upon the bright and morning star, even Jesus Christ himself. Not just to turn our eyes upon Jesus, but to lead us safely to the event of his second coming. Friends, what God has given us in his word, we need it. Because the more sure word of prophecy will show us all the way marks that we're going to pass in this life of darkness as we advance towards the culmination of our faith, and, and that is to see Jesus face to face. And unfortunately, there are some that believe that the more sure word of prophecy is not relevant. Or we try to relegate the more sure word of prophecy to a specific time or a specific event, but Lord knows we need the more sure word of prophecy because we need to keep Jesus ever before our face. And that's why the scripture tells us in the book of 2 Peter, once again, chapter one, looking at verse 12, it says, wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye already know them and be established in the present truth. There are many truths that God's people are familiar with. Many truths that God's people know like the back of their hand, so to say. But the word of God declares that the only means by which we can be established in the present truth, anchored in the present truth, is if these truths that we may be familiar with, like the second coming of Jesus Christ, these things need to be reiterated to us over and over and over again because by this means and this means alone, does God design for us as his people to be anchored, settled, established in the present truth? And that's why the scripture goes on to say right there, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13, it says, Yea, I think it meet as long as I'm in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. When the more sure word of prophecy doesn't ever stay before our faces so that we keep our minds and our hearts fixated on Jesus Christ, we tend to become stagnant in our walk. That's Laodicea, right? Not hot, not cold, but lukewarm, stagnant. God says as we consider these things, as we rehearse these things, as these truths are presented to us over and over again, it can stir us up. We need to remember, friends, that we're not just in this world to occupy in buying and selling and planting and building and marrying and giving in marriage, we have a purpose and a function. And that is to hasten the second coming of Jesus Christ as we ourselves are seeking to grow in Christ daily. That's why God wants our minds established in the present truth. It's interesting because even within the churches today, Truth has become something that people categorize as relative. It's really disturbing, to be quite honest. Even in the churches, people are beginning to say, well, truth, in a sense, is relative. Friends, truth is not relative. Truth is absolute. God told us in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 4 that God is the rock. His works are perfect, for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth without iniquity, just and right is he. God is truth. In Psalm 119, in verse 142, the word of God tells us thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and thy law is the truth. The law is truth. Psalm 119, verse 151, the word of God goes on to say, thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. Jesus himself declares in the book of John, chapter 14 and verse six, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus, the Son of God, he himself is truth. John 16, 13. The scriptures declare, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come. 
He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he hears, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. The Spirit of God, he is truth. John 17, 17, the Word of God tells us there, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And in John chapter 8 and verse 32, which we all know very well, the Bible tells us, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Friends, truth is not relative. Truth is absolute. The truth is God is truth. His law is truth. His commandments are truth. Jesus is truth. The spirit of God whom the Lord has sent into this world to comfort us, to strengthen us, to educate us. He is truth. The word that was inspired by the spirit of God himself, it itself is truth. And it is this truth when we accept it in its totality, in its absolute nature, it will liberate us from the deceptions of this world because the truth will set us free, not only from the deceptions that are being permeated throughout our globe, but it will liberate us from being in bondage to sin and Satan. That is truth. But what I've come to understand is that although many people within Christendom will say amen to all that I said as I've given definitions as to what is truth according to the scriptures, there are still those within Christendom, even within the ranks of God's end time movement and his remnant people that are spoken of in Revelation 12 and verse 17 that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ even within the midst of this body. There are those that are not familiar with what present truth is. And friends, we need to understand what present truth is because present truth is what God's people need now. It's what the more sure, of, more sure word of prophecy points us to now because in every age, God's people have had present truth. In the days of Noah, there was a present truth. I think you're all familiar with it. God said the flood was coming. Get in the ark. That was present truth. And those who did not know that truth, those who did not embrace that truth, if you will, when the flood came, they did not get into the ark. They were not in the ark. The time of the disciples, as Jesus neared the hour of the great sacrifice that he would offer for us on Calvary's cross, he began to reiterate in the ears of the disciples that they were going to take him, that they were going to crucify him, and that he would rise again on the third day. And he rehearsed, he rehearsed that truth over and over and over again in the ears of his disciples because he wanted them to be established in that present truth for that hour so that they might meet the crisis that, is getting re that was getting ready to come upon them. And unfortunately, because the disciples did not desire to embrace that truth, they didn't like it because it didn't mesh with their worldly designs. It didn't mess with their aspirations and their dreams. So they sought to put aside that message that Jesus was presenting to them. When in reality, that truth that Jesus was warning them about over and over and over again came to fruition, they were ill-prepared and they departed from the presence of their Savior. They left the truth, even Jesus himself. Can you imagine? And likewise, the same is going to happen for many of us. God in his love and in his mercy has given us the more sure word of prophecy to guide us to the event of the second coming of Jesus Christ. But if we do not give heed to what he has left for us in the Bible, if we do not take time to study and rehearse these things in our homes, with our family members, in our churches, with our brothers and our sisters, share them even with those within our communities, our employers, our employees. If we do not take the time to do these things, then my friends, not only will we not be prepared to stand in the hour of those things which God has given us for knowledge of in his word, but those who are about us, whom we love, who we care about, they as well will be found wanting. So the question we need to ask, the question that we all need to have settled in our mind is, what is the present truth for us today that the more sure word of prophecy clearly lays out before us. If you go with me in your Bibles to the book of Revelation chapter 14 and verse 1, Revelation chapter 14 and verse 1, an awesome scene is presented to our minds to consider with great solemnity. The scripture tells us there, I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion and with him 140 and 4,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. Now think about this. There's the Mount Zion, there's the lamb. 
on top of the mount with the lamb is the 144,000. And we know that this is not literal language because we're looking at the book of Revelation and Revelation chapter one and verse one tells us the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel to give unto his servant John. And that word signified means that he placed the revelation into code and into symbol. So we know there's symbolic language contained therein. And when we look at Revelation chapter 14 and verse 1, we know this is not a literal lamb. But it is speaking of the great lamb of Bible prophecy, the very lamb that John the Baptist spoke of all the way back in the book of John chapter 1 and verse 29. But the scripture tells us, and the next day John, see if Jesus coming unto him and saith, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. The Lamb in Bible prophecy stands as a symbol of Jesus Christ, our sin bearer. The one whom God in his love sent to present to us not only a life of perfection, but to take upon himself the sins of the world and to pay the price of giving his life so that we would not have to die as a result of our sins. Jesus, the Lamb of God, is the one that liberates mankind from sin if we look to him, if we place our faith in him, if we rest our confidence in him. And in Revelation 14 and verse 1, we see Jesus on the Mount Zion, and he's not by himself. The Bible says... The great Simbir is there with the 140 and 4,000. And friends, I'm not here to discuss as to whether or not this number of the 140 and 4,000 is literal and symbolic. Here's something that I'd like you to consider. The characteristic traits that are spoken of in reference to the 140 and 4,000 in the book of Revelation, those things are literal. Those things are important. Those things are what we need to embrace. And if we do not literally seek after the experience that the 140 and 4,000 are spoken of having, if we don't seek after obtaining the characters that the 140 and 4,000 are spoken of as being in possession of, then we literally will not be a part of the 140 and 4,000, whether that number is literal or symbolic. If you're with me, you just say amen at home. And this number, the word of God tells us, these people are standing with the lamb on the Mount Zion and they have the father's name written in their foreheads. It is very clear that they obtained to standing on the Mount Zion as a result of beholding the Lamb. And as a result of beholding the Lamb, as a result of keeping their eyes on Jesus, the very same Jesus that the more sure word of prophecy points us to, they have an experience. They have an experience that leads them in Christ to gaining victory over every sin in their lives, whether hereditary or cultivated. And this experience... This, this, this victorious walk that they have with the Lamb. The Bible says the result of this is that they have the Father's name written in their foreheads. What is this Father's name that is written in their foreheads? Well, in the book of Exodus chapter 33, Exodus chapter 33, looking at the 18th verse, one of the most stunning scenes in the Bible because you see a man here communing with God as a friend with friend or as a son with his father. And Moses speaks to the Lord and he tells the Lord, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And God responds in verse 19, I'll make all my goodness pass before thee. And I'll proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. So God is requested by Moses to reveal his glory. And God's response is, okay, I'll proclaim my name to you. God's name and his glory are synonymous. They are one and the same. It's a very critical issue because at the end of time, the Bible tells us that this whole world will be lighted with the glory of God. That means that this will be an event that will transpire because there will be a people that will possess the name of God. So what is this name of God that is directly connected to his glory? Well, if you just go one chapter over, Exodus chapter 34, beginning at verse 5, the Bible tells us that the Lord descended in a cloud and stood with him there, meaning Moses, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sins, and that will by no means clear the guilty. 
visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. My friends, when God declared his glory, when he made manifest his name to his servant Moses and through Moses vicariously to us, he did not show him a bright shining light. He point by point laid out before Moses the various attributes that make up his divine infinite character. He said, I'm merciful, I'm gracious, I'm long-suffering. There is no other being in existence that is like me. I am God. That is his glory. And if there is any one of us that is gracious, if there is any one of us that is merciful, if there is any one amongst us that is long-suffering, it is only because Christ is working in us because he is the hope of our glory, according to Colossians, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27. Friends, so when the word of God tells us in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 1 that God will have a people that will have his name written in their foreheads, the word of God is clearly stating to us in prophetic language that God is now, right now, raising up a people that will have his character perfectly reproduced within them. I pray that you're one of them. I pray that that is what you're praying for. That is what you're seeking after. That is what your heart yearns for. And the Lord tells us that if you seek him, you will find him if you search for him with all of your heart. Behold the lamb. He will give you the victory. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He will lead you forward. The more sure word of prophecy will keep the lamb ever in view. And look what the word of God tells us about the 144,000 and the lamb. Just jump with me to verse 4. Revelation chapter 14, looking at verse 4. It says, these are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth. Now, for, don't forget now, the lamb is Jesus. So we can clearly substitute the word lamb there and say, these are they which follow Jesus whithersoever he goes. But remember, Jesus, in John chapter 14 and verse 6, he declared himself to be the way, the truth, and the life. So let's substitute the word truth there because Jesus is the living embodiment of truth. These are they which follow the truth whithersoever the truth goeth. My friends, wherever Jesus presently is, whatever work Jesus presently en is engaged in, that, my friends, is the present truth. And the majority of Christendom has no knowledge of where Jesus is and the work that he's seeking to do on our behalf right now. And they do not know the present truth. But if we can ascertain from the scriptures where Jesus is, if we can locate him, and we can define from the word of God what work specifically he's engaged in right now, we can know of a certainty what the present truth is, my friend. So what does the word of God say on this subject? Well, just jump with me in your Bibles to the book of Romans chapter 8. Romans, the 8th chapter, and we're going to look at verse 34. Romans chapter 8 and verse 34. The Bible tells us there, who is he that condemneth? It's Christ that has died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So Jesus Christ is not in the courts of heaven just wandering around aimlessly. The word of God makes it very clear that Jesus Christ is right now functioning as our intercessor in the courts of heaven. He died on Calvary's cross to secure the right to himself to work in our behalf to prepare a place for us in the courts of heaven. And he's doing that as he's functioning as our intercessor. Matter of fact, if you jump with me in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews, Hebrews, the eighth chapter, beginning at verse one, speaking of Jesus Christ once again, what he's doing, what work he's engaged in, the scripture tells us there, now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We are such an high priest, which is set at the right hand of the throne of the majesties in the heaven, of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. So Jesus Christ is interceding in the courts of heaven on our behalf, but he's interceding as our high priest. And where is he doing his work of intercession? The Bible says in the heavenly sanctuary. In the heavenly sanctuary, Jesus is interceding for you and for I. And in particular, he is in the most holy place 
of that structure, which was built by man, no, by God and not man. Now, friends, no man or woman needs an intercessor unless we have a case that is pending in the court system of heaven. Do you have a case that is court pending in the court system of heaven? Do I have a case that is pending in the court system of heaven? The Word of God says in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 9, I beheld till the thrones were cast down. And the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head as the pure wool. His throne was as the fiery flame, and his wheels as the burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousands, time ten thousands stood before him. The judgment was set. The books were opened. Friends, right now, as we are studying the word of God, and I pray that you're studying the word of God with me. God, the Father, and his son, Jesus Christ, are engaged in a work of judgment. They're investigating the characters of every man, woman, and child that has ever graced the face of planet Earth. And in this work of judgment, God is measuring the characters of mankind against his universal standard of truth, his law, his Ten Commandments. And as God measures our characters against his universal standard of righteousness, he's looking to see within each and every one of us, do we reflect the character of the one whom is the living, walking embodiment of the truth, even his son, Jesus Christ. He wants to see Jesus in our lives. And I praise the Lord that he has not left us to try to go through this work of judgment successfully in our own strength because he has sent forth the spirit of truth into this world to guide us into all truth, to educate us what the will of God is and to empower us to actually will and do of his good pleasure. And that's what's going on right now. And as this work of judgment is going on, Jesus is pleading. He's interceding on your behalf and my behalf. He's pleading the blood that was shed on Calvary's cross for our sins. He's saying, Father, I love her. I know she's struggling. I know she's rebelling, but let's give her some more time. I want her in our kingdom. Father, I love him. You love him. That's the reason why you sent me to die for him. Give him some more time. I know by your grace, I know that he can be victorious if he'll just give us his heart. Jesus is working on our behalf. We could have no better intercessor than Jesus Christ, one whom himself was touched with the feelings of our infirmities because in all points he has experienced being tempted the same way that each one of us are on a daily basis, but he did not fall to sin. And that's why God pleads with us now as opportunity presents itself. Come boldly to the throne of grace as we're told in Hebrews chapter four. Come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and grace to aid us in our time of need. We have a time of need. Our time of need is now. Friends, the judgment is set. The books are opened. The word of God declares to us in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. The hour is now. And although the Lord has tediously done all that he possibly can in his divine power to make available to us everything that is necessary to facilitate our salvation, there are still many amongst us that act as though these truths have not been made available. Friends, the mercy of God cannot plead forever. It will not plead forever because God wants to be with his people. He wants to spend the ceaseless ages of eternity enjoying loving communion with the redeemed. And this is why he cannot allow this great 
controversy to be perpetuated throughout eternity. He must bring it to an end. The word of God tells us there's a shift that is coming in the temple where Jesus Christ is now officiating as our high priest. In Revelation 15 and verse 8, the Bible tells us, and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. A time is coming when the temple of God will be filled with smoke. No man will be able to gain entrance. until the work of the pouring out of the seven last plagues is completed. And the pouring out of the seven last plagues, well, the Bible defines clearly what that is. In Revelation 15 and verse 1, we're told there, And I beheld another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. When the wrath of God commences, the temple will be shut. And no man, will enter into the temple. And friends, prior to the wrath of God being poured out, there will be a general issue upon the face of planet Earth that each and every one of us will be brought to a position where we will have to make a conclusive decision. But the scriptures are clear in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 9. We know it to be the third angel's message. It says there, and the third angel followed, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. When every thinking man, woman, and child has made a decision either to stand for God and his truth or to embrace this mark of the beast, then the Lord in his love, in his mercy, and in his justice will pour out his wrath and the temple will be shut. And no man will be able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels are fulfilled. And if no man can enter into the temple, that as well means that Jesus Christ himself must have exited the temple to begin to make preparations to return to planet Earth. Because the word of God tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5 that there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He who understands the plight of humankind, he who understands the weakness of humanity, he himself is the one that stands as our mediator. Thank the Lord that God says, I I'm going to place one as your mediator that understands your experience and everything that you need to be victorious. Friends, he will not mediate forever because the temple will be shut. And now while opportunity presents itself, God says, wake up. Wake up, my children. Wake up and follow the more sure word of prophecy. Keep your eyes on Jesus because the work of the investigative judgment is soon to close. And although God has blessed us with the kingly powers of reasoning and judgment, it almost seems as though the brute beast of the field at times exercise more intelligence than us. You know, God tells us in Jeremiah 8 and verse 7, the stork in the heavens knoweth her appointed times, and the turtle and the crane and the swallow observeth the time of their coming. But my people know not the judgment of the Lord. These animals, when they see a change in the seasons, when they sense that the weather conditions are not conducive for their existence. They know it's time to go into hibernation. It's time to go into brumation. We need to go into hiding to spare our lives. These brute beasts, based off of sheer instinct, they can sense the shift in the seasons and they know when it's time to go into hiding. And it's interesting, if you just take a few moments to consider these animals, you will find out that each one of them, they either fall under the category of being hot-blooded 
or cold-blooded. So these hot-blooded and cold-blooded beasts, they have enough instinctive sense to know when it's time to go into hiding. But God's lukewarm Laodicean church, we don't know the judgment of the Lord. And that now it's time for us to find a place of hiding as well. It's time for us to find a place of hiding. And Jesus says, I have a place of hiding for you. Come. It's right there. We're told in Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 20. Come, my people. Enter thou into thy chambers and shut the doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. Jesus is inviting us. He's pleading with us. He's pleading with you. Come. Come, my child. Enter into the chamber. Shut the doors about you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment. Just for a little moment. Until the indignation is overpassed. We need a hiding place. We need a hiding place because a time of trouble is right upon us. The word of God tells us, Psalm 27 and verse 5. In the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He will set me up upon a rock. There's a hiding for us right now in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Those are the chambers that Jesus is beckoning us to find entrance into now. He says, come into the innermost apartment, hide yourself so that you have an anchor and a foundation that is sure in Jesus. It's just for a little moment. Friends, this life is not going to last forever. Sin will not last forever. In righteousness, God is going to cut the work short because he wants his people to be with him. The more sure word of prophecy declares it. And he's inviting you. He's pleading with you. Come in. Come in so that I can perfect my character in your life. Come in so that I can liberate you from that vice that you're struggling with. Come in so that I can set you free from the adultery, set you free from the pornography, set you free from the worldly music, set you free from your love of fashion, set you free from your overindulgence in eating and drinking, set you free from your love of money. I want to set you free. Will you just come in? Because the lamb can save you from your sins. Will you come in? Will you receive the invitation and come in? Jesus is pleading. Time is rapidly fleeing. Come in. God loves you. He's doing everything to make sure that you are amongst the ranks of the called and the chosen and the faithful but you have to listen to him. And all around the world, God is pleading with men and women today, come in. And I was in the island of Fiji a few years ago. I was doing some evangelistic meetings there at the civic center in the city of Suva, the capital city. And I remember as I was doing my morning devotions one day, the Spirit of God spoke very strongly to me. He convicted me in my heart that I needed to go at that, out that day and just interact with some of the people in the community to invite them not only to come to the evangel evangelistic meetings that I was holding, but also to invite them to embrace Jesus as Lord and Savior. And I remember going out that day with my wife and my daughter, and we ran some errands in the community. And I met up with this shop owner, it was a female, and we talked with her. It's a very wonderful conversation. We had the opportunity to pray with her and invite her to the meetings. So it was, it was a really nice interaction. But that was the end of my interacting with people in the community for that day. In my heart, I settled it in my heart that I did what the Lord wanted me to do. But in reality, I knew that I did not fully carry out what God's will was for me that day 
did the evangelistic meetings, came home, slept it off, if you will, woke up the next morning, had my morning devotions. And as I was having my morning devotions, the Spirit of God came back to me again with greater conviction than the day before. And I had to repent. And I said, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me because I know that I did not really answer the call to go out and serve the community the way that you called me yesterday. Father, today, if you'll be with me, I will go. I finished my devotions, packed a few things in a bag, went to the front step, and I prayed and I said, Lord, go with me. And as I went out, I began to interact with people in the community, invited them to the meetings. But most importantly, after praying with them, I invited them to embrace Jesus as their Lord and as their Savior. I remember meeting this one young man that missed the bus. He really didn't miss the bus. The Lord had to miss the bus to meet me. And I remember after praying with him and talking with him, there was a car that drove up. Evidently, the driver of the vehicle knew the young man, so he was able to get a ride. And so I began interacting with some taxi drivers in a nearby parking lot. As I was interacting with them, the car that picked up the young man drove back into the parking lot, flashed the headlights, and I thought, oh, he can't be trying to get my attention until the driver of the vehicle said, Chris! Then I knew he was trying to get my attention. I walked over to the vehicle, and he said, get in! Now I'm from New York. You can't just tell me to get into anything. But as I looked and I remembered, I prayed and I said, Lord, be with me. Lead me where you want me to go. I got into the vehicle and he said, listen, I need to talk with you. I need to drop these young men off, but I'll need to talk with you. I'll take you wherever you need to go. I said, okay, let's go. As we were driving down the road, he said, as we were driving down the road, he told me, my wife and my daughter and myself were watching you on the internet last night. Will you come home and preach to my family? I said, let's go. He called his daughter and he said, get the birthday cake and the tea ready. I've got the evangelist from America in the car. He's coming to preach to us. He brought all the members of his family out. They came under a little structure that was situated on, in his yard. And he said, okay, they're all here now, preach. For the next few minutes I preached, I made an appeal, the Lord blessed. He looked at me and he said, what do you have to do for the rest of the day? I said, what do you have to do for the rest of the day? He said, I want to take you to different places on the island to do 15 minute preaching appointments. I said, let's go. He jumps on the phone, he calls someone else, he says, I have a preacher from America here with me, get everyone ready, he's coming. We drove into the jungle. There was a man that came out of the brush and began to wave the car in, and as we came into a clearing, I saw something that blew my mind. Young people were just coming from every quarter, sitting down on the ground. They were having a youth camp that consisted of Sunday worshipers, young people from nine to 30, and they were all coming, sitting down on the ground. And when they all got there, the gentleman that brought me there said, okay, they're all here now, preach. I prayed and I asked the Lord to fill my mouth with his words and I began to preach. As I was preaching, the Lord told me, share with them Daniel chapter two. I said in my mind, Lord, I can't share with them Daniel chapter two. I don't have a Daniel chapter two statue. The Lord put it in my mind. You know, the guy that brought you here is a quite large gentleman. So he turned into my, Janu my Daniel chapter two statue. Head of gold, breast and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs. I went through the whole of it. And we looked at the more sure word of prophecy that took us right down to the second coming of Jesus. And as I finished, the organizer of the camp thanked me for coming very cordially. And then he told me something that touched my heart. He told me that for the whole time that these young people were there from ages 9 to 30, which was a whole week at this time they were there, all they were doing was praying and fasting, fasting and praying. And he said, this message is confirmation. Friends, I left that place realizing that God will go through extreme measures to try to open our eyes to the reality of the nearness of his second coming. If our hearts are seeking after him, if our desire is to serve him, if we are willing to surrender all to him, he will go through heaven and earth to make sure that you will be a part of his kingdom. Friends, God is doing everything. But the only thing he cannot do is choose for you. What will your choice be today? He's given us his word. It's true. From Genesis to Revelation, you can stand on it. Not one jot or tittle of the word of God will fail. He's given us the signs. We see them rapidly fulfilling all around us. And as we see the events unfolding, he says, okay, don't be fearful. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Keep your eyes trained on the lamb because he is the one that will save you from your sin.
May God help you. May God help you to behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen.